Hi, everyone. I'm Dana Cunningham, Dean of the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life here at Tufts University. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar. We look forward to hearing an engaging hour of analysis of the five ballot questions that we Massachusetts residents will be voting on next month. As many of you know, Tisch College is the proud home of CSPA, the Center for State Policy Analysis, which provides rigorous, timely, nonpartisan research on live policy issues in Massachusetts. Tisch College supports Tufts students' civic participation through courses and co-curricular programs. And we also use research and data to prepare all young Americans to be effective, responsible participants in American democracy. We work every day to support young people and in turn, all people in their meaningful participation in communities and beyond. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you will consider Tisch College and CSPA as resources now and in the future. And with that, it's my great pleasure. I'm thrilled to turn the session over to our executive director of CSPA, Evan Horowitz. Thank you, Dana. Uh, and welcome everybody to a discussion of the ballot questions. I know this is of more than theoretical or philosophical interest to people. You have a couple of weeks, at which point you're gonna have to make a decision, yes or no on the five ballot questions for 2024. So uh, I'm here to help. The basic idea is that I'm gonna spend the next 35 to 40 minutes talking through the various questions. One by one, we'll go in order, one, two, three, four, five. And at the end of that, we'll have an opportunity to respond to questions, um, see if we can be more helpful, see if we've left anything out. Uh, beyond that, we also have you know, resources that are available, our voters guides, I'll, I'll point you to all that. Um, but the idea, let's just dive in how ballot questions work and what these five would do. Uh, first slide. So again, I'm Evan Horowitz, the center I run does this every time. We are committed to ballot questions in a way that nobody else in the state is committed to ballot questions. We've been around now for four and a half years, and that means we've gone through three ballot question cycles, 2020, 22, and now 24. And each time we produce nonpartisan research on all the questions. That was two questions in 2020, four, two years ago, five this time, hopefully no more than this. It is a lot of work to talk to experts on both sides, do independent research, assemble the reports and make sure we're not getting anything wrong or at least not too much wrong. Um, this is not the only thing we do though. We also help lawmakers with uh, gathering information and evidence about the impact of their laws. Uh, you may not know this, but research capacity in the Massachusetts legislature is extremely limited. There is no research agency that lawmakers can turn to and say, hey, how big a deal is this bill? What's it gonna do? How many people would, I don't know, see a tax cut or a tax increase or get healthcare, whatever the case may be. There's no group to tell them that. Um, so we try. We try to do that wherever we can. We do the same with uh, lobbying groups and advocacy groups. Say they want to improve healthcare coverage around the state, but they don't know which interventions are best. We assess the evidence, help them figure out what states are doing well around the country and how we can follow suit. Um, but obviously tonight, I'm here to talk about the middle of these bullet points, the ballot questions. Next slide. So I mentioned this is our third cycle, but it is like the 50-something cycle for the state of Massachusetts. We have had ballot questions in this state going back over 100 years. I believe it's in the sort of 19 teens that this started. And it started as an effort to empower citizens. It's uh, an interest in direct democracy that drove the early ballot questions. And that interest persists, right? This is about saying, well, there are things we care about in this state. The legislature isn't taking care of them. Let's just ask citizens if we should advance an issue, make a change, introduce a new law. And they are just new laws. Um, that's not true in every state. It's not true of every ballot question, but it's true of all five ballot questions this year. They are just laws. They have no special import, no special power, merely because they were passed by citizens. The day after they're passed, the minute after they're passed, if the legislature decides they want to change them, amend them, overturn them, they can. Uh, these are just laws. They're not constitutional changes. They have no special force, but they are law. The minute they pass, they become the law of the land. Um, and I should say this year, sometimes there's confusion about does yes mean no, does no mean yes. In this case, it's very straightforward. We have five questions. No means let's keep things the way they are. Yes means 
let's make a change. Um, as I say, not always like that, but that simplifies things for voters. All five that, no, go back. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for going back. Um, all five this year have reached this point after 18 months to two years of efforts. It takes a long time to get a question from uh, an idea onto the ballot in front of voters. And it takes a lot of money. You need money to hire people to canvas for signatures. You need tens of thousands of signatures. Uh, you need approval from the attorney general's office. You know, you could imagine ballot questions that are written in plainly unconstitutional forms, and that would be dangerous for the sanctity of our governance. So we asked the attorney general, is this an acceptable ballot question? They sign off. Then there are more signatures. There are court challenges. Um, you start off generally any season with dozens and dozens of potential ballot questions. We are now down to the final five. And the last thing to note about sort of generic issues with ballot questions, they follow standard patterns. One of those, and the most important to know about, is that they tend to tighten up in the end. Uh, the forces of no, votes for no, tend to increase as you get closer to election day. And that's because there are lots of people, uh, unlike yourselves, you know, obviously everybody here is very interested in learning about the ballot questions, getting as informed as they can, and being able to make an informed decision about each one, but not everybody is like that. It's a lot to expect of voters. And lots of voters end up at the polls thinking, I don't really know what this would do. I can't in good conscience vote for it. Um, and that means a lot of no leaning voters in the last few days. So if you wanna feel comfortable as a supporter of a ballot question at this point, you wanna see polling that's sort of 60, 40, at least. If you're polling 51, 49, um, that's big trouble, not a slight lead as it might be in other situations. All right, next slide. So we've got five questions. Uh, the first one, and I'll go through these in much more detail, but just as you think about it, we'll do these one at a time. Should the auditor oversee the legislature? Two, eliminating the MCAS graduation requirement. Three, a union for rideshare drivers, that's Uber and Lyft drivers. Four, legalizing psychedelic drugs. And five, the minimum wage for tipped workers. Next slide. So let's start with this first question. Should the auditor be able to oversee the legislature? And the first thing to know is we have an auditor. The state has a position in the executive branch that we call the auditor. Uh, lots of states do. There is no federal equivalent. There's no federal auditor. So it's not familiar as a position in the executive branch to people who mostly follow national government, but it is common around the country. And again, this, like our ballot questions in general, this dates back to populist efforts to oversee the governor, to say, wait a minute, we voted for this governor, but who's keeping an eye on the governor? Maybe we should elect someone else whose job is to keep an eye on the governor and the governor's offices. And that's principally what the auditor does. Uh, he or she, well, I'll say she, because we have a female auditor these days, and that person, uh, the auditor, is a champion of this particular ballot question. Chiefly, the auditor doesn't do financial audits. This is not like the IRS we're not talking about looking over people's books. That's not the kind of audit that the auditor undertakes. What the auditor does is performance audits. They say, okay, you're an executive branch, you know, you're the governor's office or you're the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education or Health and Human Services, whatever department you're in, and you have procedures for buying office furniture. You can't just go, you know, over to Home Depot and get office furniture or staples, whatever it is, you have procedures in place. Are you following those procedures? We're gonna come in and we're gonna to look to make sure that you're following those procedures. And it could be buying office furniture or it could be staff training, uh, you know, any administrative functions in those, uh, in those agencies. And the auditor has a lot of authority to require the agencies to comply with the audits. They can compel agencies to provide records, for instance, about all their purchases of office furniture so that they can evaluate them. And if the agencies refuse, then the courts will step in and say, no, no, you need to provide those records. You have no choice. This is the auditor's job. These are the auditor's powers. Now, the power is not limitless. The auditor cannot compel testimony. She can't subpoena people, but she can collect records, again, from executive agencies. But that's really where the power stops, at the limit of the executive agencies. And what question one says is, maybe we should give the auditor additional power to do the same thing for the legislature not just executive agencies. What if the auditor could undertake the same kinds of examinations of legislative activities like uh, office furniture purchases or staff training or non-disclosure agreements, which is a topic that the current auditor is very interested in exploring in the legislature. 
So that's the framework for like what it does. And I should say for each of the questions, it's just two slides. There's a what this question would do question uh, slide, and there is a what the impact slide. Well, let's jump to that. So the effects, what the impact of question one. So first thing, the auditor will try to use this power. This is not a theoretical issue. It's not that the auditor said it, it says, it would be nice to have this power and then maybe someday I'll consider using it. No, no, the auditor wants this power because the auditor wants to use this power. And I say this because we spoke to the auditor and she told us that she plans to use this power if given that authority and use it pretty quickly. So you should expect the auditor to try to oversee the legislature if voters give her that authority. Having said that, it doesn't mean she will succeed in her efforts to oversee the legislature, even if the ballot question passes and legally she has the right to oversee the legislature. And there are two reasons for that. One of them sort of deeply fundamental and constitutional, the other practical. And I'll start with the fundamental constitutional one, which is separation of powers. There are certain activities that are considered core legislative activities, core elements of the, law, the lawmaker's job in the legislature to pass laws, to vote, to decide who gets to vote, to set up committees, to record the activities of committees, all of these things belong to the legislature, qua legislature, and they cannot be infringed upon by the executive branch. So there is no way, even with the additional authority of question one, that the auditor will be able to touch those sorts of questions. She will not be able to investigate committee votes or why we aren't recording committee votes, things like that. She may be able to uh, review other related issues like the office furniture issue as, a, as an example. Um, in that case, that's not a core legislative activity. There's nothing fundamental about you know, procurement issues. Having said that, in that case, the legislature has a lot of power to resist. So it's not a theoretical problem, it's a practical problem. Say the auditor says, I want to see all of your records and the new ballot question passed, I know I have the right to see all your records. And the legislature can say, no, thank you for asking. We don't want to give you our records. And you might say, well, well, how could they do that? The law says that, but they write the law. If they want, they can rewrite the law, change it. Or they also decide funding. They could defund the auditor's office if they wanted. The auditor would have no money to undertake this. So the legislature has a lot of leverage to use in this situation. There's an outside chance, there's an outside path where the auditor asks for the authority to investigate something that is outside of core legislative function, say, well, let's stick with the office furniture example. And the legislature says, no, we don't want to do that. And the attorney general says, wait a minute, she has the right to do this. Let's go to court. And the courts say, okay, she has the right to do this. You have to comply. And the legislature says, ah, okay, you got us. We have to comply. But even that's outside, that, that, even that's unlikely because the legislature still has lots of power to push back. As I say, they can cut funding or rewrite the law. Um, there is a precedent for this in the late 90s voters passed by similar ballot question, uh, clean elections law having to do with public funding of elections. And after it passed, the legislature just didn't comply. And the governor tried to compel them and the courts tried to compel them and they didn't act and they never acted and they eventually repealed the law. Uh, so this does seem likely. Now I will say this ballot question is very popular. And one reason it's very popular is because the legislature is not popular at all. And they do engage in some plainly untransparent, non-transparent, uh, opaque maybe, <laughs> activities, such as not recording votes, such as passing bills uh, late at night, um, such as making amendments in you know back rooms, things like that. Uh, so it sounds like a very good idea to give the auditor the authority to look into these practices, but it doesn't feel, our research doesn't suggest that the auditor would actually be able to exercise this power. Um, so what voters, are, who vote for yes, maybe expressing an opinion here. They want the legislature to feel their discontent. Um, but maybe even the best case there is a kind of constitutional standoff between the branches. All right, deep breath. Let's jump to question two. And we are going to be making these like quantum leap kind of jumps um, to totally new topics, leaving behind the auditor and the legislature for now and talking about question two, which is the MCAS graduation requirement. Though I should say, this ballot question is not really about the MCAS per se. This ballot question, much more fundamentally, is about whether the state should have a role in determining who can graduate from high school. Right now, in order to graduate from a public high school in Massachusetts, students have to satisfy two parties. They have to satisfy their district, right? They have to meet district criteria. 
they also have to satisfy the state. They have to meet state criteria. And the principal way that they meet the state criteria is by passing the MCAS exams, the 10th grade MCAS exams. That's, that's the main way that they do it now. Well, question two would do is eliminate the state's role in this and say districts. Districts will determine what the rules for graduation are individually, not collectively. Each of our over 300 districts will determine what the graduation rules are in that district. They will do so by certifying that their requirements for graduation meet state standards. Right? They don't have to prove themselves to the state. They don't have to go to the state and say, hey, do you like our standards? Are they good enough? They certify that they have the right standards. Those become the graduation rules for that district and that district only. Now, just so you understand the kind of landscape and how many kids are sort of caught in this, um, there's been some work, we didn't do this work, but the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education did some work to see how many students in any given year are meeting their district requirements, but not meeting the state requirements. That is, they're not passing the MCAS and they're not meeting, they're not passing any of the other mechanisms. So the MCAS is not the only, it's the primary, but it's not the only way to prove yourself to the state. There are a number of others. So how many kids are not proving themselves to the state, but they are meeting the district requirements? And the answer is less than 1%, about 700 kids in a class of 70,000. So it's a small number of kids we're talking about that are really caught in this trap. Um, but it is you know, the kids with the cognitive disabilities and limited English who are struggling most and who are most likely to get caught in this trap and most in need of some change in the system to allow them to find a clear path to graduation. Um, so now the effects of question two. So talk to folks, here's what we've sussed out, um, or what we expect to see. With the MCAS no longer being used as the state's determination of readiness to graduate, uh, the stakes of the test fall, right? And as the supporters see it, this is a real boon to teachers. This would be a boon to teachers. It would allow them to stop teaching to the test. It would allow them to re-envision their curricula their approach to students. It would allow individual districts to tailor their offerings to the needs and interests of their students. Right? It opens up a whole set of possibilities for teaching um, that don't require students to focus so narrowly on this particular 10th grade MCAS test. So that's the kind of vision of supporters. Um, opponents emphasize that this makes Massachusetts, or it would make Massachusetts, one of the few states with no statewide graduation standard, one of three. Uh, states with no statewide graduation standard. Most states set have the state at the state level set some floor and say, well, if you're going to get a diploma in our state, you have to meet these criteria. Usually it's not a test. We are a little bit unusual in having a test for that. Usually it's a set of class uh, coursework that you have to pass, you know, this sequence of classes in this order with these grades. Um, but if this, if question two passes, we won't have that either, right? Individual districts will be able to set graduation criteria, the state will not be able to say what those gradu graduation criteria need to be or should be. Uh, opponents also emphasize the risk of a race to the bottom. And, and here's, the, here's how that would work. One of the key metrics that people use to evaluate the quality of their high schools is the graduation rate. High schools with a high graduation rate are sort of generally considered good high schools. You want to get your kids through high school. And that is a fine measure if they're all meeting the same standards. But if the districts control their own graduation standards, you can see how the desire to boost graduation rates would lead to a desire to reduce graduation standards. Like one way to increase your graduation rate is to make it easier to graduate. And that would be a temptation for the 300 plus districts who will each be able to set their own standards if question two passes. Now, the setup of this, I've been talking about supporters and opponents, but just to put a face to it, the supporters here are mostly the teachers unions who are well-funded and well-organized. You may have seen their commercials. Um, they're pushing this because of the, they see the freedom that could come from not having to teach to the test uh, and the opportunities it could provide for teachers. The opponents largely come from the business community, which has struggled to organize and coalesce around either a set of messages or fundraising. So this question, which was thought to be sort of a heated, even pitched uh, battle between these forces, uh, hasn't really turned out that way because one side is much better organized or has proved much better organized. And the polling suggests, you know, that they have some slight advantage, the, the yes side, and that the no side is struggling to catch up. 
Um, but you know, I mentioned this at the end because really my focus, and I think your focus as voters should be, what are the stakes? What are the stakes on the ground? What are the stakes for students? And there it really is, do we improve or do we damage the state's education system if we eliminate the role of the state in vetting students uh, for high school graduation? Question three. Okay, another deep breath. Another big change away from MCAS, away from the auditor, and also away from short ballot questions. Um, I should say ballot question one is three or four words that get added to the general laws. Ballot question two on the MCAS is a new paragraph in the general laws. Um, ballot question three is 30 pages of detailed regulatory changes. I well, fortunately think I can boil it down. So let's do, we'll do our best. It's about Uber and Lyft drivers. So we say rideshare, it is specifically rideshare, not all gig economy workers. So we're not talking about DoorDash. This is Uber and Lyft drivers, not delivering food, passenger rides. Those drivers can't form unions. And the reason that they can't form unions is because they're not considered employees. They're considered independent contractors. And as you might imagine, a group of independent contractors coming together to negotiate on you know, collectively would raise all kinds of competitiveness concerns and collusion concerns. They're really effectively independent businesses. They can't collude in price setting. Unless, unless the state steps in, which is what question three proposes, and the state says, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna suspend all of our competitiveness concerns. We're gonna suspend our collusion concerns, and we're gonna replace them with a new framework that would allow for collective bargaining. And we will oversee, as the state, we will oversee this framework. And here's how it works. We'll let, on one side of the table, we'll be a representative for all the drivers, not just the Uber drivers, not just the Lyft drivers, the drivers from those companies, drivers from any rideshare company. They will all be actively bargaining together. On the other side of the table, the companies themselves, we'll say Uber and Lyft, and they're bargaining together, right? So they're not competing with each other here. They are on the same side of the table working together. These groups, the drivers on one side, the companies on the other, come to terms or set terms for uh, wages, for work conditions in the industry. Those terms apply across the industry. They apply to all drivers. They apply to all companies, including new entrants. Some, so say some new company comes in and says, ah, we think we can do better, uh, provide better rideshare services. They would be subject to the same rules. It's a sector-wide approach to unionization called sector-based bargaining. And it's relatively common around the world, or at least you can find it in places around the world. It, it does not as yet have any place in the United States labor system. Um, so this would be a first of its kind uh, issue. And supporters say, you know, supporters look to that and say, yes, yeah, look, we can innovate here and build a first of its kind mechanism for our gig workers to create unions. And opponents say, uh-oh, this could be a first of its kind mechanism for uh, gig workers to create unions, which could spread across the country. And those really are the stakes. Let's talk a little bit about the effects. So the first thing to expect if this passes is a major challenge from business groups, not just Uber and Lyft, but anti-union groups um, in other places. Because as I say, this would set a precedent for a uh, creating a mechanism for gig workers to unionize all across the country in all 50 states and not just rideshare, you know, uh, other kinds of gig workers or other workers who are struggling to form unions. Uh, the city of Seattle in 2015, 2016, set up a similar system of sector-based bargaining for their rideshare drivers. It was challenged in court by, by Uber and Lyft, but also by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and it was beaten back. They lost. Now, there are aspects to this proposal, to question three, that have been informed by that defeat in the courts. Um, that is, we've learned things, the supporters of this have learned things, and they've integrated that new knowledge here in a way that should insulate it from some of the same legal challenges, but there will still be legal challenges because the stakes are high and the companies involved are national. Right? The Uber and Lyft are not Massachusetts companies. In fact, Massachusetts is a very, very small market for Uber and Lyft. If it passes and the, and the drivers uh, are able to form a union and bargain, they should see increased wages and benefits. And I say this for two reasons, not just because unions tend to have this impact for their workers, they are successful in improving working conditions for their workers, but because the ballot question is explicit about that goal. The ballot question doesn't just say we want to be able, we want to enable unionization for these workers. It says 
We want to enable unionization in order to improve wages and working conditions for workers. So uh, as an example, if there is a standoff and an arbitrator is called in, the ballot question says very explicitly that the arbitrator will get instructions. And those instructions include um, making sure that any agreement improves conditions for union uh, for workers uh, and drivers. So there is no way you can get to an agreement that doesn't do that, right? The goal here is very much to improve working conditions, not just to generically allow unionization. One thing it doesn't say, right, if it says the goal here is to improve working conditions, it doesn't say the goal here is to support the ecosystem of ride hailing and make, make and ensure that people can get inexpensive and convenient rides to the airport. Um, that is not a core goal uh, articulated by the question. It is, however, one of the great benefits of the rideshare industry as it has grown up over the last 10 years. Um, there are a number of really proven benefits for riders uh, in rideshare, including reduced drunk driving. That one has gotten a lot of attention and has been demonstrated in a, a range of research. Um, but it's not the only benefit. There are other mobility benefits and users really enjoy the uh, flexibility that comes from being able to hail an Uber or Lyft as needed. Um, and I think those users should expect, the riders should expect an increased cost, right? The money that will go to increase weight, the improved wages and benefits for drivers is gonna come from somewhere. It could, part of it could come from profits. These are, they weren't always profitable companies, but they are profitable companies now. And some of those profits could go to increase wages, but the companies aren't obligated to do it that way. They could certainly raise costs um, if they can find an economic balance there. And I think the expectation is, or should be as you're voting, that they will raise costs. The last thing to note here is that little details matter a lot. As I said, this is a 30 page ballot question and some of the specific elements of it are going to play out in ways that are really unpredictable. Um, and I'll give one example, like the rideshare industry has grown up on flexible, uh, flexible driving arrangements. If you're an Uber driver, you don't have to show up every day. You don't have to show up every week. You can come, you can drive on one weekend and not drive again for three months. Do you get to vote for your union? Do you get to vote for your union representative? How does this work? And the way it's set up, the most frequent drivers get to vote for their union representatives, but you only need 25%, you only need support from 25% of those most active drivers to become the representative, which means you only need support from 25% of half of drivers or 12.5% of the full universe of drivers. That's a very low threshold to become the union representative of all the drivers. And that could play out in some very uh, unpredictable ways if there is another 12 and a half or 20% who want a different representative or are unhappy with their representative. So it's details like that that make it hard to predict the exact impact of this ballot question. Question four. All right, so this is a real change. Um, I have to say, this is my favorite ballot question. Um, not because I have particular feelings about how people should vote or the impact, but because it's the one where I learned the most um, about psychedelics. Uh, this is not an area of particular expertise for me. Um, I've gotten to talk to lots and lots of interesting folks in the kind of medical world doing cutting edge psychiatry. Um, and so, you know, I'm happy to, I'm particularly excited to share some of what we learned on this question with people, though I suspect many of you know more about the actual experience of psychedelics um, than I do. Uh, so question four does two things and you should really think of them you know, separately, because they are structured separately. On the one hand, and first, and first, it legalizes a handful of natural psychedelics for personal use, home cultivated cultivation, and limited sharing. So starting in December of this year, if question four passes, people will be able to grow, use, and distribute uh, a, a handful of drugs. So think of them, it's psilocybin and psilocin, that's magic mushrooms, it's mescaline, which most people know principally through peyote. It's DMT, which is used in ayahuasca. And it's ibogaine, which is a very powerful root. All of these would be legal to, as I say, use, grow, and share. You, can get, you can't sell them. The one thing you can't do, you cannot sell these things. And there will be no stores in which you can purchase them. This is, not, this is unlike the marijuana legalization ballot question in that way. There will not be retail stores for psychedelics. You can't go out and buy one. You can, however, find someone who's growing them and hope that that person shares with you. And I think the expectation is there will be a market in sharing. So that's half of what this question does. The other half is over time, over the course of years, the state will promulgate regulations that allow for the creation of, a, of therapy centers 
where you can have a facilitated experience of these drugs, right? So you go, you're screened, you get to use these drugs with a licensed facilitator. Now, these are not medical centers, right? They are separate from the medical facilities and they have to be because these drugs are illegal and will remain illegal uh, federally. Um, but they will be trained people who will oversee your experience and wait till you know it wears off and talk you through it. Um, you should think of this as a kind of extended therapy session or like a spa treatment. It, it, it's going to take hours and it's going to be relatively expensive because you can imagine it's a lot of time. Um, so it's not expensive because the drugs are expensive. It's expensive because there's a lot of training that goes into it. There's licensing that goes into it and you're there for an extended period of time. Okay. So on the one hand, personal use. On the other hand, these licensed facilities where you can experience all five of the drugs over time. There are a couple of other states that have already legalized psychedelics. Oregon has centers for psilocybin, but only psilocybin. Colorado has a wider array. They also uh, legalized all these drugs, though they made an exception. They do not allow the sharing of Ibogaine. Um, and they created facilitated centers just for one drug, just for psilocybin. So we're going farther than either of these states in that we're creating facilitated centers for all five um, and allowing legalization uh, sharing of Ibogaine. There's one way in which we're narrower. Colorado does say that you, can, you can't sell these things, but you can sell t-shirts and kind of give them away. Like they can be connected to sales and services. Um, we're not doing that, but we're still much broader in the sense that we're gonna allow facilitated experiences of, of all five drugs, um, the effects. So we expect from this increased avail availability of psychedelics. Now, some of this will be for treatment of some severe conditions. And there is research, um, a growing body of research suggesting the positive benefits for a range of difficult to treat conditions, uh, treatment resist resistant depression, end of life anxiety. Uh, psilocybin in particular among these drugs um, is increasingly connected to some very positive outcomes for people who've been struggling with uh, conditions they cannot shake, cannot overcome, cannot escape. Um, so there's a lot of promise, particularly with psilocybin, but to some degree with, with the other drugs. And there's also some anecdotes about the benefits of microdosing and self-care with a number of these drugs. So again, psilocybin principally. Now, some of these drugs are tied to more serious neurological, cardiac, and other problems. Uh, you know, we, we talked to someone who said that Ibogaine in particular should never be used without a defibrillator nearby, um, and yet we're allowing it for home use, and not everyone has a defibrillator. Uh, ayahuasca use um, involves some very acute neurological and physiological experiences. Uh, and that's even for healthy people. For a subset of users, for people with bipolar disorder, um, substance use disorder, Use of these drugs can um, cause uh, psych psychos psychosis, sorry, psychotic uh, episodes, um, can intensify the severity of their conditions and has other kind of damaging impacts. Um, this is one reason that the, so the Massachusetts Society of, uh, Massachusetts Psychiatric Society has come out in opposition to this question. Um, although there are also psychiatrists on the pro side who are using these drugs to help their patients. Um, so it's not as if there's a uniform opposition, but the main um, lobbying by the main industry body has come out opposed to it. The therapy centers will provide a more controlled experience, uh, as I noted, but again, at a higher cost. And there are a couple of issues just to be aware of. Um, it'll be hard to crack down on excesses and misuse. And one reason is that, well, one reason is that the fines are specified in the bill and they're very low, the fines for violating some of the core rules about how much you can grow and how much you can distribute. Um, they're a hundred dollar maximum in most cases, but also the limits are specified in terms of active ingredients. So like a gram of psilocybin, and that's hard to tell when you're looking at a bag of mushrooms, how much psilocybin is in those mushrooms. It's not a gram of mushrooms. Uh, so it, that'll make it tricky for police or other agencies to kind of crack down. And there's always the risk that the feds might not like it. As I say, these drugs are going to remain illegal at the federal level. And while Colorado and Oregon haven't had any trouble, we have had a democratic administration throughout the full legalization period in those states, and we won't forever have a democratic administration in DC. So there is the possibility of a federal interference at some point. Question five. All right, the, you've made it this far. Got one more question, a ballot question to cover, and then I'll take questions and you can tell me all the things that I uh, missed and need to cover in greater depth. This one, 
is about the tipped minimum wage. And I want to clarify up front, it is not about raising the minimum wage for tipped workers. Tipped workers in Massachusetts are already entitled to the full minimum wage. They get $15 an hour, at least $15 an hour, just like everybody else, right? So you, you will hear language about the sub-minimum wage or a lower minimum wage. That's not accurate. What is accurate is that the employers don't pay the full minimum wage. So if I'm a tip worker, if I'm a restaurant worker, and I'm getting tips, I'm getting $8.25 $8 an hour on average in tips, then my employer can pay me the other $6.75. It's actually the other way around. The employer has to pay at least $6.75. And if I get $8.25 in tips, that brings me to $15, and I'm good to go. I've met the threshold. So the tips can count towards the minimum wage. But if I don't get $8.25 in tips, the business does have to cover the difference. So I am going to get the difference. What this question does is it says, you know what, this arrangement, this ad hoc arrangement where the businesses cover some of it, that's gone. What we want instead is over time, uh, five-year phase out, to require the businesses to cover the full minimum wage. Then the tips will go on top of that, All right? So tip workers will get the full minimum wage provided by their employers. And I've been talking chiefly about restaurants. I think it's fair to think about restaurant workers when you think about tip workers. They represent somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of tipped workers. But you can also think about um, folks in salons, uh, stylists, manicurists, things like that. Now, so that's, that's the main part of question five. There's a second part of question five, which is once restaurants in particular cover the full $15 minimum wage, then tips can be pooled and shared not just with workers in the front of house, not just with the wait staff, but with cooks, with accountants and bookkeepers and all non-management employees. They don't have to be shared. There's no obligation to share tips, but restaurants would be allowed to share tips. And this is a big change in restaurant culture and it's created a lot of, or has generated some, um, some negative pushback uh, from the wait staff who nominally question five is supposed to help. Let's go to the effects. So our, our assessment of the research is that waiters and other tipped workers will earn slightly more, even though this is not really a question about raising the minimum wage. The effect of having the businesses cover the wages and then allowing tips on top of that has, in other states that have made not exactly this transition, but have altered the tipped credit a little bit or altered the, the tip minimum wage a little bit, has had the effect of increasing earnings for wait staff. And I, we expect you would see the same thing here if this passes, waiters and other tip workers on average will earn slightly more, but it will cost businesses more. Right? Businesses are gonna have to cover the full labor costs that cannot rely on tips to cover their labor costs. And that will result in a little bit less hiring, but very little bit. The effect on hiring, at least in the research is very, very small. What you do see instead is pass through into prices and service fees. Right? The, this money has to come from somewhere, Unlike, I mentioned Uber and Lyft in question three, they have profits they could potentially dip into. Restaurants don't really have much in the way of profits. It's a low profit, uh, high bankruptcy business, right? It is a very fragile business model. So you can't really expect restaurants en masse to cover this change out of profits. Much more likely, they will pass this through to customers in the form of higher prices and service fees. And you can think about service fees by far the easiest way to do this, right? You can no longer use as a restaurant the tips, the say, think 18% tip to cover the wages, but why not apply an 18% service fee? Because you can still use a service fee to cover the wages. Um, no state, and I'm gonna stick with the service fee thing, or I'll circle back to the service fee thing, um, because that's what's going on in DC. And DC is the best example, or the closest example we have for a state that has undertaken this transition. There are other states, there are seven states that do not have a tip minimum wage where businesses do have to cover the full minimum wage for tipped employees. But all seven of those states made this change decades ago. It's been a long time since any state transitioned from one system to the other. So the closest example we have, as I say, is DC. They are not a state, obviously. They are a purely urban area and they're a lot smaller than Massachusetts, but they are two years into a five-year phase out of their tip minimum wage. And the clearest effect there has been a surge in service fees. Uh, so much so that the city council has had to step in to cap service fees at 20% and to require transparency because with service fees, restaurants actually have a ton of freedom um, that is 
the owners of restaurants have a ton of freedom. They can pocket the service fee. They don't have to use it in a particular way. DC has required restaurants to say in their menus what the service fees are for. There's no such provision as yet in this ballot question. So I think you should expect to see higher service fees and also lots more conversations among you and your friends about how much you tip, are we tipping differently? When do we tip in what situations if question five passes? Uh, the other part of this, the part I mentioned about tip sharing, this has sparked a resistance, as I say, from the wait staff, from, from folks who you'd expect to support and benefit from question five, because there are lots of people, bartenders, waiters, waitresses, who get into this business because they like customer service. They think they're good at it. They like hustling for tips. And they feel like any anything that takes tips away from them harms their ability to maximize their incomes. And the threat of having their tips pooled and then shared with bookkeepers, back of house, you know, kitchen staff is very unappealing. So it's unclear because there isn't any rigorous polling of this, what share of wait staff is unhappy. Um, but I think both sides acknowledge that it is real, is not made up, this is not an AstroTurf concern. Um, there is real resistance from some waiters and bartenders and it has kind of split this coalition a little bit. All right, this seems like a good time to stop and switch to question mode and hopefully uh, share even more and fill in any errors or uh, blanks. Hi, thank you, Evan. Um, I Just quickly, I'm Amy McDonald. I work in university advancement for Tisch College. I wanna thank everyone for submitting your questions. We have a lot of questions that came in today that came in with pre-registration. We're gonna do our best to answer as many of them as we can. Um, I'm gonna try and jump around so we get to cover all of the questions um, and each of the uh, ballot questions as well. Uh, just generally, can you explain um, how we get to ballot questions in general, like how something becomes a ballot question or if it gets voted down, can it be brought again? Things like that. Yeah, so you start with money and you start with money and a strong interest in achieving an outcome that you have not been able to achieve in another way, right? You have the money to get an outcome and you tried to get through the legislature and you failed and you say, okay, I guess our only option is to go through the ballot. Let's start paying people to get signatures. Let's go through this process. So that's really how things get to the ballot. And sometimes it bubbles up from inside of Massachusetts. Uh, some of these, like the tip minimum wage is something people have been fighting about here for a long time or arguing about, thinking about. Sometimes it seems to come from outside. I think the psychedelics question is like that. There is a group of folks, or well, a number of folks, who really believe in the transformative power of these drugs and who want to find fertile ground to prove uh, the value of these drugs around the country. And they identified Massachusetts as a place that was fertile, not least because we have eight cities now that have decriminalized these drugs. And they come in and they think, okay, well, the ballot question is a good way to advance an issue that hasn't really been on the Massachusetts radar. And they start, you know, and they have the money and they rate, you know, they go through the process. Um, but it really is that question of like, okay, do I have the money to do this? Is there no other tr more traditional way to pass a law then all right, let's go through the ballot question. If things fail this time, they cannot come back the next cycle. You do have to wait. You, you will see questions you know, that appear one time and then maybe pass and then try to get overturned, um, but you have to wait an off cycle before anything will come back. Okay, we're going to move on. We'll start, I'll start with the question one. Um, do we know for sure that the auditor has the training and knowledge and experience and a nonpartisan attitude? Because as you mentioned, they are elected to take on the additional activities. So I won't speak to the particular training and knowledge of this auditor, though you don't, you don't get to be state auditor without a tremendous amount of uh, knowledge and uh, wisdom and uh, experience. So that doesn't, that doesn't always translate into nonpartisanship. And I think one of the concerns that opponents raise about question one is the potential politicization of that office. If the auditor does gain the authority, and as again, again, I said, this is very unlikely. It seems very difficult for the auditor to actually use the powers um, that the question envisions. But if they could, right? If you take the maximal view where the auditor actually gains these powers and can oversee core legislative functions, then suddenly the auditor's office is a major political player who can uh, intimidate the legislature with the threat of investigation. And it totally changes what is now a fairly mundane kind of office focused on administrative uh, operations into a very political office. 
All right, I'm gonna. Well, I could ask you, Evan. Do you want me to jump around, or you want me to stick? Yeah, jump around. I'm, I'm, okay. Yeah, I'm here. All what right, I'll jump around then. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of questions about the MCAS. Uh, question number two, and talking about if it was eliminated, what would a district be able to do? Like, doesn't that make graduation requirements subjective? Yeah. So. It probably does make graduation requirements pretty subjective. The language, what the language of the ballot question says is that the districts will have to certify that their graduation requirements reflect state standards. The question is whether this certification is subject to any kind of uh, state um, ambit. Like, does the state have any authority to investigate whether districts are matching their graduation requirements to state standards? or? Or is it totally outside the purview of the state to make this determination? I think we don't really know yet. I would be, if I were a voter, and I guess I am a voter, um, I think you should expect some pushback from the state. If this ballot question passes, I don't think you should expect the state to say, ah, we've lost all our authority. I guess that's that. We'll let the district speak. The people at the, at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education believe very strongly in their mandate and their authority to give Massachusetts the best education system they can. And they will use whatever powers they have to do that. Uh, and remember, these are just laws. So they can also work with the legislature to potentially grant them the authority they need to oversee the districts. Now, I don't know that you should vote on the basis of potential future actions, um, but I would be surprised if this is the last step in this dance. Um, I think the most likely next thing, if it passes, is for the state to think about what kind of state standards it could impose, probably not a test, probably not a return to a test, but maybe a set of coursework courses like other states do, and how it can get to that point. Okay, I'll, I'll switch to ride share for a little bit. A uh, lot of questions as to who is on what side here, because people have heard drivers being on both sides, so kind of just wondering uh, the implications. Yeah, so this is uh, this is a more traditional kind of union on unions on one side and business interests on the other. As I say, in this case, not just Uber and Lyft, but sort of national anti-union business interests on the other side. Um, it's true you can find drivers on both sides. That is, there are drivers who support uh, the lots of drivers who support the union position and are interested in this framework. Um, there are drivers who like the system the way it is. You know, they got into the system because they like it the way it is. Now, one thing that's always interesting about this, and I, I should say, I've not seen, I don't think there's any good polling on this. It's not like there are rigorous studies of where drivers stand on question three. That that hasn't happened. Um, but there's always a question of like, even if you ask drivers, is that even the right way to think about it? Because what you want to think about here is not just who's driving today, because the people who chose to drive today are obviously people who are who are comfortable with the current conditions for drivers. But think of the people who might drive in a slightly different world where there is a union, right? And those people should be considered too. What are their preferences? Um, so whenever there's a change like this, I think you know it's worth thinking both about the opinions of those in the system now and the potential opinions of those who might join a, a differently organized system. All right, question four. Um, can you talk about a little bit more about the other states that have legalized these drugs and, and the experiences people have had so far? Yeah, so there, there are two states. Uh, one, the first was Oregon. And Oregon has a very uh, narrow legalization. No legalization of personal use. Remember I said there are sort of two parts to question four. Um, there's the home use, personal use part, and there's the facilities part. They only did the facilities stuff. So question. So in Oregon, the legalization is just legalization of facilities where you can have a an experience with these drugs, oh, not these drugs, just psilocybin and just a certain type of psilocybin. They were very careful about setting this up. So just psilocybin, just facilities, and they gave cities and towns the right to opt out. So cities and towns could say, we don't want a facility and they don't get them. We, we don't have that in the Massachusetts case. Um, there's no right of cities and towns to say, we don't want these facilities, um, at least as yet. Now, Colorado is much broader. Colorado legalized for personal use the same set of drugs that we're talking about legalizing in Massachusetts, again, as I said, with the exception of sharing of Ibogaine. They, however, said for their facilities, only psilocybin, only psilocybin in the facilities. They can consider others later on. Neither of these seats has seen any major public health issues. So it's not like they legalize drugs and there have been, you know, story stories of kind of dramatic uh, issues, problems, you know, teenage ayahuasca parties, the things you might worry about. 
Um, it's only been a few years, but to date, the public health record seems pretty good in both places. Okay, quick follow up on that. Are, can you tell us which groups are opposed to number four? Yeah, so I think I, I said the leading group in opposition is the Psychiatric Society. Um, and it is sort of medical public health folks mostly on the no side, which again is not to say all medical public health folks are on the no side, but they're the chief voices on, on the no side. Um, and the yes side is a mix of people who have had positive experiences with these drugs, um, people who believe in the potential, and those who are thinking way outside of the medical thing, who just believe that these drugs enhance the human experience and should be more widely available to people who are interested in living out their fullest lives. All right. Uh, question number five with tip workers. Uh, there was a question that came in about the idea that this would ultimately reduce the overall income of tip workers, uh, either with consumers no longer tipping or tax implications. So could you talk further about that? Yeah. So, I mean, this is definitely one of the concerns that opponents raise. Uh, it is not supported by the research. So as I said, the, most states have some kind of tip credit system like we do. But they change it all the time. They'll say, well, it used to be that businesses only had to cover $4 of the wage. Now we're going to make them cover $8. So you can use those changes to look at the impact on actual earnings. And there have been a number of studies over the years, and they very consistently find that workers earn a little bit more when you increase the amount that the businesses have to pay. Not a lot more. This is not transformative changes, but it is definitely not a decrease in earnings. Now, that doesn't mean that this is true for all workers. We're talking about on average, we're talking about the median. There are certainly workers whose, the majority of whose pay comes through tips. Think of workers in really high-end restaurants, for instance, who might be hurt in a system where businesses cover more and tips get pooled. But I think on average, the research is pretty clear that workers end up earning more when you ask businesses to cover a higher share of their minimum wage. All right, we got a lot of questions on who's on which side here. So do you have advice for how people can better understand who's funding these questions and campaigns? A lot of times they're, you know, general names or innocent sounding names rather than um, the people who are behind them. Yeah, I mean, there are really no surprises, right? Like it's not, it's not like, oh, there's some, what? It's shocking who's, who's funding these things, um, you know? So to, question one is probably an exception here. There aren't, there's no big money to interest on either side. In fact, there's no organized opposition to question one at all. The legislature decided they would not mount an opposition, even though they oppose question one. Um, and I think their lack of interest in mounting an opposition reflects their confidence that this isn't going to hurt them and that they, they can resist this if they want. Uh, question two is a very clear kind of teachers unions are, are raising money. On the business side, has struggled to raise money. You can see this. There are filings, so you can follow the filings, and they come out more regularly now. I forget how often, but you can go uh, the OCPF website. I forget what that stands for, but it's the public financing kind of information website for the state, and you can see who's funding. But it's you, there are no surprises, um, and it's business interests on the no side of question two, but they're struggling to raise money. Um, question three has less money than you'd expect. Also going into it, I this is the one that has surprised me the most. Um, support coming from union groups. Opposition, I expect it to be really well-funded from Uber and Lyft. Uh, it has not been. There are, they have not mounted the kind of aggressive campaign that I anticipated. I, not, not me alone, but that people anticipated. Uh, and it's still unclear to me why that is or, or how they're envisioning this playing out. Um, question four, question four also, not huge money coming in, um, but you can follow those groups. And yes, those groups are less well known because they are not, as I said, these are not homegrown coalitions. Uh, most of the time, these are coalitions that are new to politics, right? It's not every election that the Psychiatric Society decides they're going to endorse or oppose a question. It's a very unusual territory for them. And the supporters have been working in other states, so they're not, you know, familiar names. But again, you can you can track the spending there. And then question five, the strongest opposition opposition group has been the restaurant industries. So they have an existing industry group that has. Uh, raised successfully raised a fair bit of money to oppose this, and the supporters are a mix of, um, you know, folks in state, a workers' rights organization, and progressive organizations in state, and the thought leadership is really coming from a group out of state that works on this question all around the country. It worked in D.C., worked in Flagstaff, was working in Michigan, and and really believes in the value of eliminating the, the tip minimum wage. All right, I'm going to try and get through these again at least once with the questions we got coming in. Uh, so for number one, are there substance, 
what are the substantive issues we need to think about here? I know you mentioned office furniture, which, you know, people is, so, is a good example, universe, but people are thinking about, you know, what actual issues and, and what's the recourse if there's no action. Yeah. So I don't think most of the issues are not particularly substantive and it is not the auditor's job to unearth substantive issues. It's the auditor's job to unearth administrative issues and administrative challenges chiefly, uh, like office furniture, like procurement, like staff training. That's really what the auditor is charged with doing, asking whether agencies and departments are following their own rules for doing the things that they're doing anyway, not with investigating policy matters. Um, that doesn't mean there are no substantive issues on the administrative side. There are, you know, staff training really matters. If you are not giving staff the, uh, so say the sexual harassment training that you've promised to give them, that's a substantive issue about uh, legislative management. And that's something that, you know, again, in this sort of unlikely but not impossible case where the auditor does gain some authority, that's the kind of thing that the auditor might be able to pursue. But I think, you know, it's better to think of like, of the auditor as really having administrative auditing function and not not generally touching on kind of substantive lawmaking issues. It's not it's not the office. It's not the role of that office. Okay. Question two, MCAS. Do you have a sense of what school district administrators are thinking about that? Is there a way to get an analysis of? I know you can't predict and read people's minds. Yeah. Is there uh, any way? <laughs> then we would maybe do be doing different no, things. I'm going to struggle with this one. I think they're all over the place and they're torn because they have allegiances to their teachers who feel strongly and to the union and they're not going to come out. And, you know, this, this is a difficult position that they're in. Uh, there are obviously lots of uh, education leaders who believe in the system that we've built over the last few decades and want to sustain it. There are others who see the virtues in giving, you know, more autonomy to districts. I've not seen anything rigorous. I think it would be very hard, even if you conducted a poll, to get kind of honest reactions uh, from folks in positions like that. I think the follow-up, is there any way to get an analysis of the potential harms and benefits to the question for high versus low performing districts? And in addition, the support of the teachers or admins in those districts, if there's a difference. So I think, I mean, the instinct behind the question is right. Like uh, the people most likely to benefit are the districts that are already succeeding. You know, if you're a district that has the internal capacity to really thrive without state uh, rules around the MCAS, then you're probably a district that's already thriving with the state rules around the MCAS. And if you're a district that's struggling to teach to the test, and I should say this test is not a particularly difficult test, right? It is a test that ultimately over 90% of students pass. If you're struggling with that, then you are probably going to struggle to produce really rich uh, classroom materials and curricula. Uh, now, we will still have, the MCAS is not going away. It will no longer be the graduation standard because the state will not have a graduation standard, but the federal government requires the standardized testing of high school students. So we will continue to administer the MCAS. So we will still see which districts are, you know, where kids are learning, where there are gaps. Um, one problem there is without the stakes, um, kids are not gonna take that test seriously and the value of what you learn from the scores will diminish as well. Okay. Uh, ride share. Uh, what's the general reason for the approach of sector-based bargaining in question three, as opposed to simply reclassifying the drivers as employees? Well, the state thought about, well, the, the state undertook a lawsuit to reclassify the drivers and then decided, this is in the spring, that, to settle that lawsuit. Um, and the settlement with the companies says, no, we will accept that they are independent contractors provided that you offer the following baseline wages and benefits. That's the existing settlement. So um, there was a push for a while to see about reclassifying them as employees. Uh, the state backed away from that. And there doesn't seem to be much prospect for re-engaging on that in the near future. And this is an alternate path to improving uh, their work experiences and um, rights. All right, we got a few more minutes. I'll do a few more questions. So for number four, um, are any of these drugs under review right now by the FDA or legal for medical use in Massachusetts currently? Yeah, so a number of them are under review and showing promise, you know, psilocybin chief among them. Um, there are studies, uh, you know, less so of Ibogaine, which is like, the, like there's a spectrum here. Um, and, you know, when we started this re research, there was an expectation among experts that, there would be psilocybin-based drugs approved by the FDA within a few years. 
people are less optimistic about that or less confident about that, uh, in part because of some recent MDMA trials um, where the, there were folks put, advancing a drug based on, on MDMA and they thought they would be able to get FDA approval and they were not. Um, and the FDA has now expressed some concern about this, not least because you know it's very hard to double blind a study where the people getting the placebo do not have a psychedelic experience and the pe people getting the real drug do have a psychedelic experience, right? Everybody knows if they're getting the drug. And that makes it just very hard to study the, the efficacy of these drugs. All right. Uh, last one on the ballot questions uh, specifically. Um, on the tips, on number five, basically the question is about the two parts of this ballot question. So we have the tipping part and then the sharing part and just a little more detail on the front of the house versus the back of the house and how those all got paired together. Yeah, so I wish I had a good answer to how they got paired together. Uh, we've been asking this from the beginning. They do not seem to me and have not seemed to us to be naturally or inevitably paired together. Uh, when you ask supporters why they both got included, uh, the answer you hear is that this is how they do it in the other states. There are seven other states that already require um, businesses to cover the full minimum wage in those states, apparently. Uh, they also allow tip pooling among the broader staff. Um, I don't think this necessitated a similar approach here, but it's the approach they took. So I don't think you should think of these as inevitably joined, uh, just haphazardly or historically joined. Uh, and it's not clear to me, I mean, that that could be the reason that this doesn't succeed um, because it, it has generated this additional sort of dimension of resistance. All right, thanks everyone for hanging in here. A little extra time tonight. We just have one final question, um, more of a general question on these ballots. What is the polling looking like right now? Like what are the likelihood of each of these getting passed? Yeah, so I don't wanna put too much emphasis on, on this because obviously, you know, uh, people are still learning. You're here because people are still learning about these questions and the polling on questions shifts a lot as people learn coming down the wire. Um, but I can sort of generally handicap. Question one uh, has a tremendous support, support in the, you know, kind of 70 plus percent. Um, the legislature is very unpopular and uh, appeals to oversee the legislature are therefore very popular. Uh, that probably has the most support from among the questions. Um, question two is polling, you know, kind of, there are a lot of undecided. So it's sort of maybe 55, 35, something like that, uh, which is less strong than people hoped, supporters hoped. Um, but I think, you know, with, unless the business community can come together and raise more money, um, which they've so far been really unable to do, the supporters are still in a, a strong position, I think, to advance that. Question three also, I think this is the one where there's like the most uncertainty. Um, polling does again suggest kind of 55, 40, again, like with lots and lots of undecided. But I think this is one people just don't really know. And I'd expect maybe the biggest um, mismatch between polling and uh, election day results. Question four is underwater, I think, in the polling. Um, so support for psychedelics, that one's running like 41, 45, or sort of low 40s, low 40s, and then undecideds, um, which is really hard to get from there to passage. And then question five, also uh, really struggling. I think support levels in the 40s from across polls. Um, but there's a lot of variation among the polls because people still, you know, learning, gathering information. But, you know, uh, Mass Inc. does great polling and the Boston Globe has been polling on this. And I expect to see more polls in, in the days ahead. All right, we've come to time, everyone. I know we can continue to ask Evan questions, but um, I want to say thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Evan, for sharing your expertise. Um, I more expertise, just... you know, in our reports. So if you, you know, if you didn't hear what you needed to hear from me, see if uh, see if we wrote about it. Yeah, we've shared the um, in the chat, and we can share it again. Perhaps the. Um, the ballot guide. I'll actually share it again right now, just so everyone has it. Um, so everyone can check again, check the CSPA website and take a look and see if there's anything else that you guys can um, be offering. Uh, we want to say this, we hope this is just the beginning for your informed discussion of all your issues and candidates with your peers, and you begin to take advantage of the many opportunities to engage in the electoral process. With these tools, remember the most important part, check your voter registration, encourage your friends and loved ones to do that, and of course, go out and vote um, either early by mail on election day, wherever um, you can. 
I also want to say the work of supporting civic engagement and building capacity and space for everyone to participate in our shared democracy goes on all year long and every single year, not just election years, um, from K-12 to teachers, college students, administrators, advocates, movement builders, policymakers, and especially the young people themselves. Everyone, we're all vital to building a robust and inclusive democracy. So today was just one step and we hope um, here at Tisch College and CSPA, we hope that for many of you, this won't be your last step. So thanks again for joining us and have a great night.